let's look at a bit of the history of how the internet came to be because it's you know aside from being interesting uh, it also gives reasons why things are the way they are and why it was pretty successful now way back in in the uh, 1960s the US Department of Defense um, had this uh, advanced projects research agency um, advanced research project agency yeah ARPA and they were given the job of trying to find out uh, how how a network could be devised that would be quite robust. Now at the time um, communications were, were point to point, uh, very much like um, the phone networks of the day where uh, you'd go from one point and you would, you would have a dedicated circuit to the other point that you wanted to reach. Now at that time um, the concept of packets and packet switching had just started out so the, the um, project group in ARPA uh, that, that was uh, told to go and investigate this came up with this, um, basically it's a, it was a network that uh, sent packets across the network and reassemble them at the other end. So it didn't matter how they got there, as long as they did get there, and the job of the receiving end was to assemble the packets in the uh, correct sequence and then play them back. Now this was helped by the fact that there was enough capacity on the um, uh, network to, to do that in, in a reasonable time. Um, but anyway, the, the uh, result was a packet switch network, which was called ARPANET. Now, uh, in order to get something like this working, you have to have not only the definition of the packets, so that was um, the, the makeup of them and the, the, um, the envelope and things like that, but you also need an addressing scheme. Now this uh, eventually was implemented as uh, TCP, so that was uh, tele um, Telecommunications Control Protocol, uh, or Transfer Control Protocol, and IP, uh, the Internet uh, Protocol, it, I think it was, uh, TCP IP. Now that was uh, invented in 1983, so it was quite some time after ARPANET came into being. Now that, the, the necessity for um, ARPANET and a packet switch network uh, was simply because at the time uh, servers were pretty unreliable. The, you know, the operating system had bugs and the hardware itself wasn't that reliable. And you couldn't exactly have a reliable communication network uh, where some things could drop out. So this whole idea of a communication network where, uh, that could cope with the dropout of a particular node or any particular node in the network, um, it would simply switch to a different circuit and just send, send more packets. I mean, if the packet failed to get there, you just sent it again. Now, Tim Berners-Lee, uh, did implement network-based hypertext in 1989. Um, more about that in, in a minute. The Mosaic web browser, um, the, the first sort of coherent interface to the uh, internet, was built in 1993. Uh, and Netscape followed in 1994. And then things kind of exploded. Um, there was a rapid uptake of all this technology and it uh, went very, very well. Now Tim Berners-Lee is fairly famous in internet, um, in, in the invention of the internet. And it's, it's, you, you get the impression that he actually invented the whole thing. Now this wasn't quite true. However, what he did was quite brilliant and uh, very well done. Now at the time, um, Apple had a, an application called HyperCard. And this was like uh, a stack of cards, and, you know, if you, if you can imagine a um, stack of uh, six by four cards with links between them. This was what a hypercard was. You could have this stack of cards that were mostly text-based and there was links between some piece of information on one card and another piece of information on another card. And that was great. Now, unfortunately, it was only on Apple. It was a single machine and single user. Tim Berners-Lee thought this was pretty good, but he wanted one that was multi-user and on a different machine. So he, he built um, a hypercard-like system on the Multics operating system, and he called it Inquire. Okay, so that was 
at some time. But when he went to the um, nuclear, or the, sorry, the research laboratory CERN in Lausanne, he was impressed with how many scientists came and went and how much information was lost that either went with them or it was just forgotten about. It's like, you know, people come and go and you have no idea what's in their filing drawers. And this loss of information uh, was considerable. So Tim Berners-Lee thought that some kind of expanded uh, version of his inquiry program would be a, a pretty good thing to do. So he put together this proposal and you can see a photo of it there, that's the cover page of it, and um, sent it in to his boss, Mike Sandor, who thought it was all a bit vague, but very exciting. So he encouraged Tim Berners-Lee to have a go at it. And uh, Tim Berners-Lee obviously did. Not on his own, there were other people that helped him to do these various things. But the whole, whole idea of uh, Tim Berners-Lee was to um, create a system where all the information could be made available and shared across the community of, of scientists and researchers at that laboratory. Some of the design decisions that were made at the time, even in the original proposal, which is readily available, you can, you can Google it and find it and download it and have a look at it. There were a couple of fairly significant decisions. Uh, one was, should there be security or not? And given that this was intended to be used in the scientific community, which was very open um, as the research community tends to be, it was considered that security was not necessary and would simply add a complication to the whole thing. So security was not implemented. Similarly, there was a decision about whether this should be stateful or stateless. Now, the intended use of it was to access information information tends not to have a state. It exists. It exists the same way today as it does tomorrow and the same as it did yesterday. There is no particular state attached to it. So rather than complicate the whole thing with trying to implement a stateful system, when basically they didn't need it, they decided not to do it. So as a result, um, HTTP, the Hypertext um, Transfer Protocol, is in fact stateless. And that presents some problems. Uh, that if you need to transport the state or need to know about the state, then uh, the workaround for that was to um, have cookies. And the cookie stayed with the client. And any time the transaction was updated, then the cookie was updated and it got transferred, you know, got uh, shifted around. So that's, that's how state, the stateless HTTP arose and that was what the workaround was and as and, um, far as I know it still is. So the whole idea is that uh, you, you post, you get a login, um, you, you, um, a cookie is generated by the server and stored by the client. And that client then provides that cookie in the current state to the server at any time there's a transaction. And in that way, um, we keep track of it all. The hypertext markup language, HTML, uh, also was taken from um, a long-standing um, collection of uh, markup languages, uh, going all the way back to GML, the generalized markup language. Now, GML is very big and very powerful, probably too big, so it got uh, standardized to SGML, and SGML is the markup language um, that you know, is the granddaddy of them all and probably always will be. Uh, it, it is not static and it's not a star record, it, it is maintained, but it is this, the standardized general markup language. From that came uh, a restricted a cut down set called XML. And XML uh, is, um, is standardized in its definitions and there's, there's a, a complete standard on it uh, that you can, you can find, you can buy and you can use. As well as that, um, SGML has this concept of a document type and one of the very fe essential features of uh, SGML is the document type definition. So that's one of the things that says, right, what, you, what this is, is a document of this type, which defines what it, uh, its layout and its structure and the contents and things like that. So we get DTD and we break down into further specializations. Now, HTML um, 
is or was um, conventionally defined for use on the internet. So it has some conventions of its own, and it's um, uh, it, it continues to evolve. We're now up to HTML4. The type of information has also uh, evolved. Originally, it was just static information. You just got the information, or you placed the information. It was static. However, with the machines that we were using at the time, there was uh, there's obviously a certain amount of dynamic content and there was this uh, feature that was available in the Unix operating system where you could do a remote procedure call. That is, from this computer I could send a message to another computer to say execute this procedure which was sitting on the other computer. So RPC was there and available and uh, it was a, a text-based thing because you could type it across the, the terminal. And so that was easy to implement, and so they did. Um, that meant that you could actually have dynamic content come across the internet as well. Now from that, these the procedures got kind of, um, they grew up a bit, and instead of being just standard um, utility procedures, because initially there were things like um, uh, go uh, report the directory structure or um, print out this file or, or something like that. Now that's that's fairly static and it's just uh, essentially a utility. But there wasn't a great deal of difference between doing that and actually executing a program that did something clever. So uh, now we've got into componentized enterprise applications. So the internet has, has evolved fairly seamlessly from its uh, origins as a static information provider to something that's quite dynamic. The term web systems itself uh, is the umbrella term uh, of a group of loosely related web-based resources and components that may be used by other web applications over HTTP. And the resource could include anything from phone directory data to weather data to sports results. So web services are services provided across the internet. And that's a, a very loose collective term for the whole thing. Now, web services do let computers talk to one another over the internet, uh, allowing computer programs to exchange information uh, by eliminating barriers such as um, hardware platforms and coding. Um, now, you may think that this is not a big deal, but believe me, uh, prior to the internet, if you wanted to move from one computer to another, you had to be concerned about just exactly how the information was coded. All the IBM machines use EBCDIC encoding, so the characters are stored in EBCDIC format. Pretty much everybody else on the, uh, uses ASCII format. And you think, yeah, okay, that's fine. However, the characters are stored as two, um, two bytes, uh, or it's, they're stored in the byte, um, in the two different uh, halves of the, the byte. And the question is, which one are you going to store first? Now, this is called Little Endian and Big Endian, and I'm sorry I don't know exactly what the uh, convention of it all is, but I know I was surprised when I worked on um, a VAX machine to find that the characters are stored not in the manner I, I had expected them to be. So there's obviously a difference there. Now, the, the problem is, how do you transmit information across different computers? Now, the internet, HTTP uh, specifically, gets over all that by providing conventions for how you trans translate from your native machine into HTTP and how you, how you take things from HTTP and interpret them locally. So this enables computers to seamlessly uh, communicate and that's a great advantage.